Hello, we are back. This is going to be part three of our lecture video series on the general principles of nutrition chapter. It's Dr. Jenkins here. We ended part two of the video with a review of the basic structure and function of all the nutrients. All right, so make sure you're studying that. You're beating it into your head until you know it. Like you can just spout it off in your sleep. Okay, so a couple odds and ends left in this chapter. One of the topics that we have to address is what are the nutrient guidelines out there? How, how are we supposed to know what to eat and how much of each to eat? There are many different guideline systems out there. Uh, many more than one for sure. So we're going to cover a couple. And as always, I'm going to let you know what you need to know and what is extra and what you don't have to know for our quizzes and exams. So you should just know that there's something called the DRIs, Daily Reference Intakes. Daily Reference Intakes. And the DRIs is actually a category so you can see where it came from here, um, blah, blah, blah. I do want to point out, though, that it was developed by people in the field of medicine and nutrition. It is based on research, that this is research done in the U.S. and Canada. So this would be specific to this country and Canada, so this continent, mostly, um, and it's updated. So we can see, therefore, that it's pretty legitimate, okay, backed by science. And these DRIs, it's a whole grouping of specific guidelines. I've listed them at the bottom here. We're going to be talking about the RDAs. We're going to be talking about the ULs. And we are going to be talking about some of the energy recommendations also, but let's just start with the RDAs and then the ULs. Everything else you don't need to know. Um, this one is one that was not on your list to know, the estimated average requirement. You can read about it. Um, the downside of this is that it only meets about half of the U.S. population. So not great. Instead... We will tend to use the RDAs. I know I'm going through a lot. Feel free to read the slides because you have access to this PowerPoint. Um, but I want to focus on what you need to know. So maybe you've heard of the RDAs. For every specific nutrient, there's an RDA. And what it stands for is Recommended Dietary Allowance. So you can see I have a keyword here. It's really a recommended amount of each nutrient. So for an American, for an American, the RDAs tell us a recommended amount of each nutrient you should be ingesting to be healthy. Unlike the other requirement, the EAR, the RDAs are expanded a bit to meet almost everybody in the population. We're not going to get bogged down in the statistics and the science of that. But suffice to say that these RDAs will be good for almost everybody. So pretty much 97 to 98% of the U.S. population, these recommended nutrient intakes will apply to. Oh, All right, here we go. Um, okay, don't worry about that. We're not going to get that specific. This is another one that you don't have to know. Adequate intake. It does re refer to lesser known foods, but you don't have to know that. The other one I'd like you to know is the tolerable upper intake level. Say that 10 times fast. It's kind of hard to say 10 times fast. Tolerable uptake, excuse me, tolerable upper intake level, the UL. This is an upper limit for when you don't want to consume too much of something. 
So it's the upper limit of what you can ingest and it still be healthy. That's a good way of putting it. It's the upper level of what you can ingest of something and still be healthy. A good example of when these might come into play would be with certain vitamins and minerals. Certain vitamins and minerals, if you take, if you ingest too much of it, uh, it can actually have very serious negative effects. So for every vitamin, for example, there's an upper limit that's set. Even something like vitamin C that we know is good. Um, but remember, the vitamins and minerals are micronutrients, which means, as you already know, that we don't need to ingest them as much for them to do their job in the body. So on the other hand, if you ingest way too much of them, and you exceed the upper limit, uh, it can actually do harm. You don't need to know any of these specifics. I just wanted to give you some examples. Uh, this came from an earlier edition of your textbook. If you have the textbook now, it's going to give you an updated one. Um, what you can see on here are some of the RDAs. Uh, I just covered it up there, but look. Here's the RDAs, the recommended amount of carbohydrates we should be ingesting in grams per day. We have the RDAs for protein. Grams per day and then both grams per kilogram per day. That's pretty cool. And then it breaks it down by males and females by age group, even pregnancy. Now, does this mean that if you didn't meet this, you're going to die in one day? No. But it gives us a ballpark, okay? You can probably understand that if you eat more carbs than you need to on one day, you're not going to die. You might gain a little bit of weight, but what's more important is how you meet these recommendations over the long term, over weeks, over months. So because of that, it's good to have some ballpark figures. Here are some examples of the upper limits, the tolerable upper intake levels, the ULs. So I told you it's mostly going to be for vitamins and minerals. Okay, I mentioned vitamin C, so we can see for children, adults, we can see if you take more than that grams, or excuse me, milligrams per day, you could be at risk for negative health impacts. You don't need to know any of the specifics, just know the definition of tolerable upper intake level. Now, so far we've talked about two nutritional recommendations, the RDA and then the tolerable upper intake level for vitamins and minerals. Now we're going to add another one. And we actually saw this earlier in the PowerPoint, earlier in the video, the AMDRs. That technically stands for Acceptable Macronutrient Distribution Ranges. You don't have to know the whole thing. Just know AMDRs. These are based on energy, which is another way of saying total calories. But we already know these. We already know these. Play along with me, folks. Because you've studied as you've gone along because you want to do well, you already know the AMDR for carbs. Let me hear it. What? What? 45 to 65% of all of our calories should come from carbs. Fat. 20 to 35% of all of our calories should come from fat. Protein. Somewhere between 10 and 35% of all of our calories should come from protein. Sometimes I wonder how many times I can go through this and still have people miss it on the exam. If I repeat things over and over again, you can pretty much guarantee they're going to be on your quizzes and exams. Okay, so AMDRs, the percentages of our total caloric intake. Another way of looking at what should we be eating? Um, I told you before that these AMDRs, the percentages, it's a range. And it's a range because people are different whether it's gender, age, whether it's activity level. There's all sorts of things that make people different. So, for example, we know that carbs should make up somewhere between 
45 and 65 percent of our entire caloric intake. So I've compared a marathon runner to a, a sedentary couch potato. Wouldn't a marathon runner need more energy, more carbs? Yes. So they would fall on the upper end of this range, whereas a sedentary person would fall on the lower end. Is there one exact right number for everyone? No, but at least it's worth a consideration. You need to meet the needs of that person. Um, last thing I want to point out would be when you add these up, they're going to equal 100%. So if you were to ever kind of think about, well, what about me? I wonder how many, you know, what percentage of my calories should come from carbs, fat, and protein? Whatever you come up with, it should add up to 100. Uh, it could also be things like someone with diabetes. Um, they, they should have less sugar, less carbohydrates. A weightlifter is going to have a much higher amount of protein. Is there one exact right number? No. Um, but we can certainly see that a weightlifter needs more protein than a non-weightlifter. Actually, that number might be a little bit low. Maybe I would bump up that protein to be a little bit higher for the weightlifter. Another recommendation. Whew. So what have we covered so far? Let's do a little summary table as we go along. We talked about the... RDAs, okay, recommended daily allowance. We talked about the tolerable upper intake levels. And then we talked about the AMDRs, which were the percentages of how much of our diet should come from carbs, fat, and protein. Um, here's another one. So this time the government, these previous ones were kind of set more by independent associations or organizations um, the government comes up with another one choose my plate so here's our fourth example of a recommendation um, and this you know if you're of a certain age like myself you were you remember the good old four food groups and then the food guide pyramid well now we've moved from the food guide pyramid to Choose my plate. Um, so what I want to say here is, and I think I've already established it, but let's just be, be sure. It can be hard to think about, well, let's make one system that's right for every person that tells them what exactly they should be eating. And it's really hard. So the goal of all four of these recommendations we've covered so far, the goal is just to give us a basic roadmap or give us a ballpark figure. It's not meant to be necessarily precise all the time. It's meant to just give us a basic roadmap so that when we think about our diet, we don't have a big old traffic jam. We don't want that. We don't want to just be ho-hum eating whatever we want. That was my cat sneezing. Bless you, Mr. Big, my cat, Mr. Big. You'll probably hear more about him. He likes to come over when I'm recording. Um, what we don't want is someone not thinking at all about their nutrition and just going off of whatever they want at any given time. I know if I, would did, if I did that, I'd probably be eating a lot of cookies and ice cream. Um, so it's important that we at least have some guidelines. Not that we need to follow them perfectly, but we need to have some ballpark, some basic roadmap. For my plate, we're going to keep it really simple. You don't need to memorize everything about it. Um, as you can see here, let's see. Fruits and vegetables should make up half of the plate. Look at that, folks. The idea here is that you're supposed to look at this dinner, this plate, whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, um, and you're supposed to look at your plate and see that half of it is fruits and vegetables. Um, we, we do want to have good quality protein, grains. We want to limit things that are overly fatty. I think it's pretty common sense. Right now, what I want to point out is the my plate 
half of your plate should be fruits and vegetables. And let me ask you, how often is half of your plate fruits and vegetables? I happen to be mostly vegetarian, so I tend to follow in that. Um, but just saying. Um, my plate also has some other options. You don't need to go and spend an hour on the website, myplate.gov. But I do want to point out that there is a website you can use where you can put in your own information. And they do offer some specific guidelines for specific populations. Because, of course, a kid versus someone who's pregnant, uh, they're going to have different dietary needs. Now, I'm going to mention some other tools. Here we go. You do not need to know these. As a matter of fact, I think that a more recent one has been released. This one from 2010 is, uh, wow, 10 years old now. You don't need to know this. Don't worry about it. Um, but I think it makes sense. So the government, for example, puts out some other guidelines. I mean, we know that we should have a nice balance in calories. We know that we should reduce high sodium. We should not do excessive alcohol. We should increase fruits and vegetables. A lot of this is self-explanatory. Of course, the hard part is actually carrying it out. Um, I know it's easy to make this plan, but then when we go to the grocery store, the Cheetos look really good, don't they? It's important that, especially with kids or even as adults, that you build a healthy eating pattern. Um, it's not supposed to be so strict. <laughs> Because if you do it too strictly, oftentimes we crack and then we binge. Um, yeah, so you don't need to know these. Just giving you some other tools that are out there. All right, coming down the home stretch here. I want to mention a couple other tidbits. And one of them is serving sizes. What is a serving size of protein, meat, fish? What is a serving size of pasta? Because I know for me, <laughs> my pasta dinner is definitely much more than one serving. All right. Like I do, I have made a nice summary table. And I'm only asking you to know what is starred. It's important that we know a serving size because what we're going to talk about next in this chapter is a nutrition label. And when you read a nutrition label, the nutritional facts are given by serving size. So it's important for us to know what a serving size is because often we eat more than one serving size. So what do you need to know? I'd like you to know that one serving size of meat, chicken, and fish is only three ounces. That's about the equivalent size of a deck of cards, that rectangle, or the size of a, a, a female's palm. If you go out to eat, certainly you're going to get more than three ounces. So you need to know that technically, when you read the nutrition label, you need to double up those nutritional facts. Um, let's talk about vegetables. And uh, let's go with pasta. One cup of pasta is one serving size. Think about the little measuring cup that you have when you're cooking. That little measuring cup, I cannot draw for the life of me. That little measuring cup that you fill up half cup of milk in to put in your whatever, or half cup of brown sugar to put in your barbecue sauce. Or one cup, excuse me, one cup. One cup of pasta really isn't that much. I know I tend to eat more than that. Um, and then let's talk about fats and oils. It's not star, but I'm going to star it. One, teas one teaspoon. Should be a P. One teaspoon is a serving of fats and oil. All right, so just know those that I've pointed out. I'm not going to ask you all these. That would be a little ridiculous. And of course, this is just common sense. We know this. Serving sizes have increased over the years. 
Um, what I've noticed particularly now is when I am in the gas station, convenience store, or whether I'm in the, in, in the checkout line at the grocery store, the candy bars are basically now the size of two what used to be individual candy bars. Think about a drink. Oh, my God, the big gulp. You go to see a movie. The small soda is like a big bucket. So it's changed. Um, when we eat out, um, the, eel, the meals that we meet out at, how about I can't talk? The meals that we have when we eat out are almost always more than one serving size. Not to say that it's never okay to have more than serving size. Of course, sometimes. You want to have a six-ounce steak? Go for it. Just know that that's two serving sizes. If you had two servings of, two serving sizes of steak for every lunch and dinner for a week, that's probably a little bit too much. And again, when we look at the nutrition labels, it's by serving size. One cup of pasta, whew, that's pretty small. Um, some examples here, if you look at like a little... Um, bottle of soda that's actually two and a half servings if you look at a bagel i looked up a i looked up a dunkin donuts bagel that big ass bagel is about three to four regular servings of grains pay attention we'll talk about this later i'm going to skip that for now all right coming down the home stretch ladies and gentlemen this is a really important part because we're going to be talking about carbs, fat, and protein, grams, percentages of total caloric intake. Um, so one skill that you're going to learn through this course is how to read a food label. Food labels have been required since the 1920s, the FDA. This was mostly after uh, Upton Sinclair's book about the horrible meatpacking industry to try and get some regulation. Uh, maybe you didn't know that we've had to have food labels for that long. It's pretty cool. Of course, they're updated. And one of the great things about the food labels in this country is that they are standardized. So you can see the picture here on the right. This just makes it easier. So when we look at a nutrition label from one product to another, because they're standardized, we already know how to read them because they all get read in the same manner. What I do want to point out here, pretty much everything is required to have a food label, okay? If you walk the aisles of the grocery store, pretty much everything needs to have a food label. Um, let's see. Even if you look at the produce section or if you go to the meat counter or the fish counter, you're not likely to see, especially if you get meat from the counter, if you have them, you know, serve it up themselves for you, you're not going to see a label directly on the food. But if you ask for it, they have to make it available. The only exemptions, things that do not have to have a nutrition label in the grocery store, and actually I said this before and I apologize I was wrong, the deli, sometimes they do but they're not required, the bakery, ready to eat foods, spices, and coffee. You need to know that these are the only things that are not required to have a nutrition label. All packaged foods need a label. And when I say packaged foods, I mean the foods in the aisles, not at the ends. You know, usually on the outer edge of the grocery store is where you find the deli counter and the bakery and the fresh food that they're selling. But all the packaged foods in the aisles of the grocery store, the cookies, the crackers, the pasta sauce, pretty much all the packaged foods in the aisles are required to have a label. Even some of the non-packaged foods, let's talk about produce and meat. Even though they're not necessarily packaged, the produce, they're required to give you that information if you ask. The only exemptions, 
things that are they're not required to give a nutrition label on, deli, bakery, ready-to-eat foods, spices, and coffee. Okay, so let's just have a look here. And I don't want you to be intimidated because, we're not, first of all, we're not going to go through everything on the label. We're just going to get the basics. And I'm here to help you. Okay, just had a sip of water there, sorry. What you're going to see on a nutrition label would be the serving size. And that's why it's important to know the serving size. So here's a macaroni and cheese box. The serving size is one cup. Most of the labels will also tell you how many servings are in that box. Here it says servings per container, two. And really, I'll admit it, and you probably can admit it too, we've probably eaten a whole box of macaroni and cheese, all two cups of it. But that would technically be two servings. You're going to see the calories per serving. We're going to see the actual value of grams of the carbs, fat, and protein. Then we're going to see the percentage. And then we're going to see the ingredients. Make sure you're reviewing this. And we're going to go through some examples together. Um, let's first mention about the ingredient list. So either at the bottom of the nutrition label or on the side, you'll see a list of ingredients. Here I have a nutrition label and ingredients for the legendary taste of the LA Light Bars. Ooh la la. What I want you to know is when you see the ingredient list, What's listed at the beginning is present in highest amounts. It doesn't tell you exactly how many, but we do know that the things listed up here, there's more of. And oftentimes what you're going to see, what's listed first is some kind of sugar. Here they say the first ingredient in these LA light bars is caramel. Sugar. Of course they want you to buy it. Even though it's a light bar, they load it with sugar. Um, and they tell you what's in that caramel, corn syrup, sugar. <laughs> uh, then we see it, the second ingredient is a coating, which is made up of sugar. What's the next one here? Uh, soy nuggets comes next. Honey, soybeans. And then whatever is at the bottom here, so there's less roasted soybeans textured soy flour. So the items listed towards the end of the list are present in lowest amounts. All right, so when you see that ingredient list, pay attention to what's listed towards the beginning because that is what there's most of in that food. Um, I've given you some examples here um, just to practice. So here I have an example of reduced fat, which is 2% milk, and then non-fat, 0% milk. Uh, it's the same serving size, 236 mils. This, whatever container this was in was only one container. We can see the calories are different. If it has more fat, 120 calories per serving versus 80. Let's look at the fat, right? We can see the grams of fat. So in the 2% milk, there's 5 grams of fat per serving. In the non-fat milk, there's 0 grams of fat. How about the carbohydrate? In the 2% milk, there's 11 grams of carbohydrates per serving, and it's the same amount of sugar in the zero and the non-fat. There's also the same amount of protein, 9 grams per serving, 9 grams per serving. So really the only difference here is in the calories and the total fat. Just practice for us reading the labels. I wanted to give you an example of something that was a little bit more sports related. This is actually an old picture of what the Cliff Bar, now they look a little bit different. Um, what if we look at the grams of the nutrients? Let's look at the nutrients. Carbs, fat, which is a dietary fat, and protein. How many grams of carbohydrate is there in one serving, which is a bar? 
How many grams of carbohydrate? 45 grams. Wow. How many grams of fat are there? A total of five. How many grams of protein are there? A total of 10. So what is there most of in a Cliff Bar? By far, sugar. And there's more sugar than there needs to be. That's for sure. But again, why do they add so much sugar? So it'll taste sweet and delicious, and so you'll buy more of it. Let's look at an example of a whey protein. By the way, I'm not going to ask you how many grams is in the Cliff Bar of protein. I'm just giving you some examples that we can work through together to read the labels. Whey protein. Uh, what is there going to be most of? Let's do the same thing. Carbs. Fat. And protein. So what is the serving size here? Serving size is one scoop. Of course, you're going to dissolve in water. Uh, and one scoop is actually 41 grams. So per one scoop of this whey protein powder, 154 calories. How many grams of sugar? 10. Is that really that many? No. Which is a good thing, because this is not really meant to have a lot of sugar in it. How many grams of fat? Very little. 1.6 grams of fat per one scoop. But look at the protein. 25 grams. That's a lot. What is there most of? Protein. Which is kind of consistent with what it's advertised as. But a, a good whey protein should not have a whole lot of sugar, should not have a whole lot of fat. It's really meant to give you some protein. All right. Before we end this, I want to go back and I want to do one more thing. Then we'll be done, okay? All right. Let's make a list of what you need to know about nutrition labels, because I want to be very clear. So what do you need to know? You need to know that from a nutrition label, we can see the serving size. We can see number of servings in that food item. We can see the total calories. And then we can see grams of carbohydrates in grams, how many grams of fat there are, and how many grams of protein there are. Make sure you also know that underneath or beside the nutrition label, you will see an ingredient list. And as we talked about, what's listed first in that ingredient list is present in highest amounts. What I also want to point out, in addition to the grams of carbs, fat, and protein, in addition to the grams of carbs, fat, and protein, let's do orange, we can also see the percentage of daily value. Here it is. But, so not only does it give us the grams of carbs, fat, and protein, it gives us the percentage. So remember we went through the AMDRs. Uh, for carbohydrates, we should be ingesting somewhere between 45 and 65% of our diet from carbs. For fat, we should be ingesting somewhere between 20 and 35% of our total calories from fat. Remember those? Well, they give you those percentages. Check it out. Boom. But I want to give you caution. Because these are not the percentages for your number of total calories. How could they do that? Because everyone's different. So they can't tell you what percentage that number of grams of carbs, fat, or protein is from your total caloric intake. So what do they do? Let me, what color can I use now to make the point How about light blue? What they do is, is they give these percentages 
based off of a standard 2,000 calorie diet. So all of those percentages are based off of a 2,000 calorie diet. And it even says that. If I look on this macaroni and cheese label, look at the bottom. Percent daily values are based on a 2,000 calorie diet. Your daily values may be higher or lower depending on your caloric needs. So be careful when you look at these percentages. Oh, this means that I'm getting 18% of my fat, or excuse me, this means that I'm getting 18% of my calories from fat. That's not bad. Oh, I'm, I'm only getting 10% of my calories from carbs. Well, it depends because they always base it off of a 2,000 calorie diet. Because of that, I prefer to look at the grams because that's the same for everybody. No matter who you are, if I have one serving of this mac and cheese, it contains 12 grams of fat. All right, well done, everyone. Make sure you're studying hard. We still have a lot to cover. If you have any questions, reach out to me. Happy to answer them.